Network, and we are glad to have you all here. You probably just got a, um, a notice that this is being recorded, just so you know, and also so that you know if you have uh, friends and family who would like to watch it later, it will be available. Um, another uh, logistical thing is that you can always be writing questions in the chat throughout, um, throughout this webinar, and we might not get to them right away, but we'll be keeping track of them and try to get them back to it toward the end. So why are we having this conversation about intergenerational worship? There are a lot of things we could say to that. Um, but one is that we tend to um, we tend to sort of plan our worship around the broad middle of our communities. And you can think of that in a lot of ways. And when you think in terms of um, age, it might be the adults in the room, the middle age, or maybe your congregation has a kind of bulk of your um, uh, age group that you just tend to get in a rut thinking about those as the worshipers in your um, in your community, and we always need to be thinking about the margins and who are, how are we including everyone in the conversation and everyone in worship. So this is uh, just one way to do that. There are all kinds of ways to think about including everyone. And so today we're just focusing on age. And summer is a great time to try new things. Everyone's um, schedules, many people's schedules, I shouldn't say everyone, but many people's schedules are changed. And so um, some, some churches have uh, smaller numbers. Some um, churches uh, change their entire schedule for the summer. So this is a good time to, to be thinking about trying new things. So we are very happy to have uh, four panelists today. Um, Roberta Jancy Egley is the Executive Director of Messy Church USA. Roberta, can you wave so everybody can see you? Thanks. Um, her spiritual formation occurred in a small rural Mennonite church of her childhood and continued at Mennonite high school and colleges. She was ordained in the United Methodist Church, and she lives in Eugene, Oregon, with her husband, Lynn, her youngest son, Jesse, and their dog, Jack. Justin, Justin's son, can you uh, wave, please? Um, he's in his first job as a pastor in Richmond, British Columbia, primarily working with youth and families at two churches, Peace Mennonite and Peace Chinese Mennonite. He's new to the Mennonite church and Anabaptism in general and is grateful to embrace and be embraced by such a deep and rich tradition. Wendy Jansen is pastor of Burning Bush Forest Church, an outdoor worshiping community that has been gathering outdoors year round. Wow, year round in parks in Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario since, uh, Ontario since 2016. She also serves as eco-minister for Mennonite Church Eastern Canada, and I think the MCUSA people on this call as we were talking beforehand decided we need that in MCUSA too. Eco-minister for Mennonite Church Eastern Canada, and is a co-founder of the Wild Church Network. And Joel Beachy is the pastor at East Union Mennonite Church in Kelowna, Iowa, and he lives there with his spouse, Christine, who's a volunteer coordinator at the MCC thrift shop in Iowa City, and they have two boys, Isaac and Lucas. And finally, the co-host today, um, well, two co-hosts, Annalie Leptison oh. is uh, the co-director of Anabaptist Worship Network, and she'll be monitoring the chat and uh, making sure the recording is going well. And Shanna Peachy Bushart is, um, works for MCUSA, and in her role there as denominational minister for Christian formation, she connects MCUSA faith formation leaders to resources that equip them to nurture faith in children yeah. and adults. She yeah. also accompanies individual That's leaders as a coach and consultant and is the Mennonite Education Agency liaison to the Mennonite Schools Council. Participants. Yeah. I will turn it over to Shanna to um, ask the first question of our panelists. We'll first um, ask some questions to our panelists and have them speak for a bit, and then we'll open it up to um, questions from the rest of you and um, further conversation. So Shanna, you can go ahead. All right, hello everyone. Nice to be with you. Um, I'm gonna start by um, inviting Roberta to share from her experience. So Roberta, could you please start us off by giving a brief explanation of the basics of Messy Church and also why you became involved in the Messy Church movement? Thank you, Shannon. Thank you uh, for the invitation to be with you all today. 
Uh, my elevator speech uh, includes the five foundational values of Messy Church, and it is this. Messy Church is a creative, celebratory, Christ-centered, intergener intergenerational worship that welcomes all people. So that's the short speech. It's a church. It is church, but maybe not how you know it. Usually, Messy Church meets about monthly rather than every week. So there's some other things that you can do in the midst of that. That. Why the name? Uh, really, um, it's because the founder of Messy Church and the people who founded it was um, realizing that a lot of people have this conception that you need to have your life uh, and and messy church is not that. You bring who you are, your messy lives, your messy relationships, who you are to messy church uh, and all of the wonderful messiness. It's a global movement. It started in the UK about 18 years ago. Uh, now has about 3,500 churches throughout uh, the globe uh, in over 30 countries. I became in Messy Church because I became involved because as a pastor in a United Methodist Church here in Eugene, Oregon, we were really looking for ways to reach beyond the walls of our traditional church to reach our neighborhood. And when we did some demographic studies, our two largest demographic groups was aging baby boomers and then the other one was uh, single and partnered uh, uh, adults with small children. So looking for a way to bringing those generations together. Um, so we, we researched it. We started a messy church. And then I became involved um, uh, when I went to an international conference uh, when the founder of Messy Church, Lucy Moore, asked if we could maybe create some kind of um, network in the United States. So Messy Church USA began in the fall of 2017. It's a nonprofit. We are partners with the global Messy Church movement. And um, I think what led me to it is that I've always been involved. Uh, it, I've always been passionate about bringing people together of all ages uh, to be creative, to find ways of worshiping with all of our senses, with, with all of who we are. And I really view it as a calling. So that's, that's, uh, that's my, I guess it's a little bit longer than an elevator speech. We went up to the 150th floor, maybe. Thank you. Um, can you share with us a little bit about the kind of the, what does a messy church um, service or gathering look like? And um, tell us a little bit about the resources that are available on your website um, that and introduce people to how to, they can do it themselves. Sure, and and I do. I saw that you put our website in the uh, in the chat. I would recommend you go there. We do have some uh, videos on there, and also um, we do have a training that's starting. If you're at all interested in doing messy church, it really is um, a way of people gathering together, exploring the Bible scripture story in uh, a variety of ways through activities and games. People are sort of meandering. Uh, this is pre pandemic pandemic and sort of moving into post pandemic, we've been doing it other ways during the pandemic, people sort of moving around, uh, exploring the same Bible story, but through different activities and games, and then everyone coming together for a time of singing a time of prayer and a time of hearing the Bible story again, this time in a more uh, participatory manner where everyone's all in the same room. And then messy church usually ends with a meal. Uh, uh, around the table with a meal and usually rather than a one hour worship experience usually messy church is at least one and a half to two hours uh, so and it really you need a team it's not an individual uh, thing you really need a team to be able to uh, do a messy church does, does that answer your questions a little bit more yes um, I have just I'm really encouraged and um, interested in what Messy Church is doing. I think it's a fabulous model for um, for for all churches, right? And I think it's very much needed um, in these days. Um, even pre-pandemic, I was enthusiastic about introducing this model to Mennonite churches, but even more so now. Mm -hmm. 
Do you want yeah. to say a quick word about how you see messy church fitting within the ethos of Anabaptism? Yeah, I think the the focus on um, being Christ centered, about being focused on the way of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and the modeling that Jesus gave us, and how we are to live, really fits in with the Mennonite ethos. Um, I have not had an Anabaptist theology class for quite some time. I was I I. I have been in the Mennonite church for many years, but about 20 years ago, um, moved into the Methodist church and became ordained in the Methodist church, but still have connections with the Mennonite um, community also. And I was formed in a small rural church that was intergenerational. We just, I learned how to sing by being around people of all ages, aunts and uncles, cousins and uh, friends, and uh, being in worship together and singing together. I think singing was our biggest participatory type of event together uh, and so I think that's so I think being formed in community is very important as disciples and I think that really fits in with the Anabaptist understanding that we're not individual that that we're individually in community that we bring our gifts into community and it's really in the community that we grow and become Christ-like together so we don't um, we don't have any Mennonite churches really that are doing messy church that I know of. There may be some that I don't know of. We have had a few that have attended some trainings, um, but um, I'm, I'm always willing to uh, work with um, conferences or uh, local churches or whatever to help people get started in a positive way. Oh, I did have a quote I wanted to share. I'm sorry, I forgot I wrote it down about, about being in relationship and, and um, thinking about changing the world and how we are here to make the world a better place. And the quote is from uh, Dr. Paula Guder. She says that we are to join in the great dance of God. Now, I didn't dance very much when growing up in a uh, conservative Mennonite uh, rural church, but I still like to dance. Uh, and that God is already changing the world. Our job is to join in the work that God is already doing. And in that dance. Oh, hallelujah. Thanks so much, Roberta. And now we'll go back to Katie. Yes, thanks. Um, Justin, can you tell us a little bit about your two churches where you pastor and tell us what we can learn about intergeneral worship from Asian Canadian churches? Yeah, no. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here with you today. Um, yeah, this is a, a really near and dear endeavor for me. I work for uh, two churches in a, in a very strange setup that honestly, I'm still figuring out a lot of times. Um, so one church is uh, very, uh, you know, classic uh, German Russian Mennonite um, who have been around uh, the Vancouver area for, for a number of years now. And then I also work for a much younger a Chinese church that um, because if you're ever in the Vancouver Richmond area you'll know that there's a tremendous uh, population of Asian peoples uh, from all around Asia honestly um, we're in the area and one grew out of the other so this question of intergenerational worship is literally I mean in in, in an hour or two I'm going to step out and go to my office and I'm just going to continue to try to figure that out uh, literally in week to week but also in really really big picture so yeah, I, I wish I had a 10 step plan for you today, um, but I don't. Um, but if anybody does feel free to forward that to me, I'll 100% love that. Um, so yeah, today, um, when, when I was kind of first asked about this, I was like, I think it would probably be more uh, useful for me to lean into my experiences growing up rather than a, yeah. You just said they were going to replace the furniture. Uh, whether that uh, uh, any potential expertise, quote unquote, that I may or may not have. Um, so I'm bringing in more kind of my story and, and, and the story of my people, um, because as also uh, some of you may know, people a lot smarter than me have said worship is largely about story. Uh, it's about God's story and about our story. So I think story would a good place uh, to, to, to bring up some of these things to discuss. Um, so real quick, um, just for me specifically, uh, my story as a kid, I grew up in, in, as an, in an immigrant church in Canada in, in the 2000s. Uh, it's a story that I and many who share my background and upbringing are still figuring out. 
And I think mining some of that is really, really great. And we, we continue to be confronted uh, by all across the continent. I would reckon both men and I, or not, uh, both uh, Asian Canadians and Asian Americans. Um, so what can we learn uh, about intergenerational worship from these experiences and from our people? Uh, the first thing I think uh, is important to know is that because of much of the Asian Canadian and Asian American church um, largely sprung up alongside kind of the story of immigration in the last 50 or so years, um, the topic of intergenerational worship is completely pervasive in, in the week to week and in the big picture. If you walk into any kind of Asian Canadian and Asian American church today, you'll often find that there's two or maybe even three uh, vastly different generations, right? You often have a parent or gener uh, grandparent even, uh, generations who often immigrated to North America, who were often the first Christians in their family, uh, who came here and tried to figure out life in a new and, and sometimes hostile world. And then there were the kids like me, the brats like me growing up in church, uh, who were born and raised here and, and who were largely uh, kind of figuring ourselves out within that uh, context that our parents set up. And, and in my life, the question of, of intergenerational work uh, beyond before even this job uh, was underlying for so much of what I did. The question was kind of like, okay, our parents immigrated in the 70s and the 80s from various parts of Asia, right? They became Christians at points in their journey. Faith meant this to them because of those circumstances, but we're born here and we're raised here. And what does faith mean to us? And, and what does it mean to worship in ways that work for us? And for better or for worse, um, probably both, uh, that has often meant a strong kind of break away from our parents' generation in a variety of ways, um, but most typified in corporate worship. Uh, literally, again, I'll say it, if you walk into any of the hundreds of, of Asian Canadian and Asian American churches across the continent, you'll often see a literally a, a, a parent's language uh, worship service and then a kid's language uh, worship service. And the question is, you know, how do these gel? Right? How do we not just end up with two churches? How do you not hear, or how do you have uh, not have the parents' generation just brush aside the kids or the kids brush aside the parents, right? There's a lot that can be said in that, and I could probably ramble too long about all of that and what that all means, but for the purposes of today, I wanna to focus in on kind of one thing. Um, I think one thing Asian Canadian churches can teach us about intergenerational worship is um, I think it shows us the importance of understanding the story of your church, uh, where you're from, how you got here, how you need spaces to tell those stories so you can understand why things are the way they are and where your church needs to go. So whatever your church's heritage, right, whatever the culture and nationality, racial makeup, theological tradition, your church has a unique story and, and that needs to be brought into the light in conversations about intergenerational worship. This is really big broad uh, direction for practical week to week things, but it also a uh, big broad direction for, for church direction and vision, but also for week to week things. Um, so I think, yeah, that allows kind of three things to happen when you, when you tell your story. It honors those who have come before, right? It allows that collective wisdom to be shared in conversations about intergenerational worship. Second, it honors where you are now, right? It, it helps you be honest, whether you're a thriving church, whether you're in the weeds a little bit, being honest about where you are can help you acknowledge some of those difficulties or celebrate if you're in a really good space. And lastly, it really helps you plot a course for, for where you want to need to go. Uh, when I think about kind of Asian Canadian churches and the diversity there, it energizes me, right? To, to think, okay, this is where we've been. This is how faithful God has been. Now, how can that mean something new for the future? So in some there, um, I know I've, I've had a lot, a lot, there's a lot, so many tech points on, on so many things I've said, but in some, I think that Asian Canadian churches, because many of them are so young, because it's so tied to a recent immigrant experience, because intergenerationality is practically worked out week to week, uh, it shows us the importance of knowing your story, of owning your story, and letting that be a guide for intergenerational worship. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Justin. You didn't say explicitly, but I hear you also saying, don't assume that you know someone else's story. If we make room for them to, to speak their story, we have to be willing to listen and hear something other than what our story is. Um, can you draw this uh, more specifically into Anabaptist Mennonite um, circles? What is this? What can this say to um, other Anabaptist Mennonite churches? Yeah, I know that 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 again is also really tied to my own personal story and how I ended up here today, because uh, I think a corollary of, of one of the questions or all the questions above is 
a lot of you might be thinking, well, you know, my church isn't monocultural, it's intercultural, or we have many people from many different spaces and backgrounds, right? Um, yeah, I, I don't have a specific answer for everyone's different context here, but a little bit of my story might inform that a little bit. Um, because I, I stumbled upon Anabaptism Mennonite and Mennonite churches almost by like complete accident. Growing up, I had no idea what the Mennonite church was. I literally had never heard of Anabaptism. And, and I thought if you asked me like five, six years ago, I'd have been like, oh, it's Amish people, right? Like, because I grew up totally uh, in, in a different context, in a totally different setting. And it wasn't until I, I, I kind of stumbled upon a, a brand new place um, almost just by Googling and, and finding these spaces, right? That's how I, I came to this. Um, so all that to say, uh, continuing on this idea of story, I have a really weird one. Right? I grew up as this Chinese Canadian kid drinking bubble tea and eating hot pot growing up to find, you know, finding myself all of a sudden kind of discussing about community yeah, hermeneutics and, you know, decentralized church structures and stuff like that. But in, in figuring out and learning those differences, I've also actually come to find a lot of similarities. Um, there's tremendous, tremendous amount of similarities found, I think, in a common humanity, right? So one thing that I've really appreciated since the start of my embrace of Anabaptism is that emphasis on discipleship, actually. Um, I've, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's, it's big in other traditions too, but it wasn't really until it, I came to Anabaptism that it became so explicit and so, uh, common to talk about it on a day-to-day -day thing and I realized kind of looking back it's like wow actually that was a really big thing for me growing up too right um, it, it may not have been as explicit we may not have had conversations about it exactly but looking back like I got to where I was in large part because of the the like uncles and aunties and, and various older brothers and sisters in my church that looked out for me and who cared for me and like there's a, there's a tremendous similarity there and how I think it applies to um, worship and intergenerational worship is it, it really showed me, I think, kind of how important um, that aspect is before you even show up on a Sunday. So worship that is truly intergenerational to me and across age groups begins long before you even sing a song or a sermon is preached or a meal is shared, right? It's kind of like Monday to Saturday work. And, and I think both Anabaptist and Asian churches have really shown us that. And because for me, it was people who looked out for me, who cared for me, who cared about what I was about. So that when I showed up on a Sunday, I was ready to rock and roll, right? Not literally, but I was ready to, 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 to be in, because when I see people around in the congregation or I see people um, up at the front, it was like, wow, that's a person who has cared for me, who has looked out for me. That's a person whose life has witnessed to me the love and power of Jesus, right? That was so intergenerational that even if we weren't sitting around talking about community hermeneutics, that even if we weren't talking about what is discipleship, right? Um, these are things that really modeled to me a life together. And so that these are, that's a tremendous way I think that these, these two things have intersected and that have shown me and I hope kind of help you think about your life today about like, wow, okay. You know, Sundays are really hard. Intergenerational worship is difficult. There's no easy answers, but how are people in my congregation pouring it into each other's lives from Monday to Saturday so that when we are together on Sunday, it's a lot more natural as an outpouring of what already is. I always think, and this is my last point here, that, that Sundays are, they're like a junction, right, between what is and what can be. It's, it's a starting point and an end point, right? If it's a starting point, for life together, it, it energizes you to go from Monday to Saturday, but it's also the ending point in the sense of it needs to be something that is the, the, the conclusion of a life shared together from Monday to Saturday or whatever day that you worship in. So yeah, that's how I think kind of Asian and Anabaptist contexts have intersected in my life. And, and yeah, I'll end there before I go on for another half an hour. So great, thanks, Justin. All right, let's turn to Wendy and Wild Church. Um, Wendy, could you give us a brief explanation of just the basics of Forest Church? I'm sorry, I called it Wild Church, Forest Church, and um, how you became involved in the Forest Church movement. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'll start by answering how I got involved. And I'll also say that um, I think for me, wild church and forest church are sort of interchangeable terms. Um, and uh, I, 
I was a pastor at a Mennonite church locally and was on sabbatical um, eight years ago. And during the course of that fall sabbatical, um, one of my neighbors who grew up uh, attending a Mennonite church um, and was just a little bit younger than me and a mother of two kids uh, confided me uh, that she was done with church. She just uh, couldn't attend anymore. She said for her, it was just sitting in a building, listening to people talk and it wasn't anything more. And she said that um, where she really encountered God was outside on a hike. And she would rather take her, her family out on a hike Sunday morning than go to church. And that's, that's how they would nurture their faith. And the conversation continued. And, and she said, but it would be nice to do it with other people, like in community. And it would be nice if there was something more than just a hike. And I, I just listened to this conversation um, and felt like there was something going on there that I needed to pay attention to. And that same fall, my oldest son was enrolled in a forest school program. And forest school, uh, at that time, eight years ago, it was brand new here in Ontario. It was this new, um, it was a part-time thing, although now there are some full-time forest schools, but my, my children would go out uh, one afternoon a week and um, would be invited to sort of immerse themselves in the place, in the land, and allow their, their curiosity and their, um, their play and their engagement with nature to be um, sort of the, the foundations of what they were doing. So it wasn't curriculum driven, it wasn't teacher driven, but it was engaging with creation or with nature, they would have said, um, and nature being one of the teachers as well as the location where they were, they were um, engaging. And um, it was like an epiphany for me one day when I was picking my son up from forest school. But if there could be such a thing as forest school that engages um, children's innate desire to learn and curiosity and engages them with nature or what we would say creation as um, a way of learning, how could that apply to church? And could there be such a thing as forest church? And what would that look like? And my brain just started spinning and it just uh, sort of blew my mind thinking about this. And uh, I figured, oh, maybe I'm not the first person to think of this. So I Googled the term forest church and there was a website based in the UK, just like Messy Church, um, of a group of about a dozen or so forest churches that had started gathering outdoors for worship they would say in and with creation. Um, so it's not just transplanting normal worship into an outdoor setting, but engaging with creation in our worship. And so they had a book, I, I bought the book, I read it. Um, and uh, by the end of my sabbatical, I said to my neighbor, let's give this a try. Um, let's see what happens if we, if we go out uh, in December <laughs> and, uh, and try this and she was all for it. And um, that was sort of the seeds of how it started um, for me. And then it was interesting that at the same time, there were a handful of other people across North America who also unaware that other people were doing this were also taking worship outside of the building and um, very intentionally engaging with creation, with God's presence, uh, with God's imminence, with God's, um, revelatory spirit uh, in the natural world. And we, we found each other and that's how the Wild Church Network started. But anyways, a forest church service um, begins with a grounding time, a, a time when we engage our senses in the place where we're gathered and remind ourselves that we are gathering with the land and with the more than human world um, among whom we are present. Um, we bring ourselves into awareness of God's presence, God's presence and active spirit in the place uh, through prayer. We read scripture together. And one of the, the quotes that I love from Wendell Berry is that the Bible is best read outdoors and as far outdoors as possible. And so when we take scripture outside and read it under the open air, how does that change uh, our understanding? Um, 
And then from there, people are invited to wander and wonder. So half an hour of our time together is spent with people free to wander. And then we come back together and share with one another. Uh, some, sometimes we might have communion or another ritual, and then we have a sending blessing. And I asked my 12 year old son at lunch today what his favorite part of Forest Church was. And he said the wandering time. And I said, well, what do you like about it? He says, well, that I can move around and that it's outdoors. Um, so yeah, I think that kinesthetic uh, piece uh, that's often missing in, in some of our worship, uh, indoor worship is, is a big part. Um, but I know that for him, he's 12, and um, he will go and he will wander and he will usually find a place and just sit for 10 minutes on his own, paying attention to what is happening around him, thinking about the scripture, about what God might be doing, um, where God might be present. And then he wanders back and participates in the sharing with the adults. And so the sharing sometimes happens in small little groups. Sometimes it happens in the full circle. and people of all ages participate in that sharing, offering something as simple as, I saw a woodpecker, or something more profound, like I noticed, I felt God's presence as I was sitting beside the stream and the rocks were, the, the water was flowing over these rocks and it just resonated with how I'm feeling a bit of turmoil inside and God was there. So it's a very um, organic, <laughs> a way of encountering God. And um, yeah, maybe that's enough for now. And you can ask your next question. I love that. I mean, one of my favorite things about what you're saying is that opportunity for people individually to go and like just experience on their own. Um, it opens up a space where people can encounter God one-on-one. -on -one. I just think that's really beautiful and exciting. Talk a little bit about how you see the Forest Church movement fitting in with the Anabaptist ethos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like some others have mentioned, I think um, the community aspect of it is key. Um, it's not, you know, the sort of thing that we hear sometimes, oh, nature is my church. Um, you know, going off on your own and encountering God, this is community. We do this together. Um, and we bring that sense of community and togetherness, sort of a priesthood of all believers idea into how we are interpreting scripture together. Because it isn't just a pastor, you know, providing a sermon that everyone is then consuming and, and thinking about. But we, uh, one of my contemporaries in the Wild Church Network um, is an Episcopal priest. And he, he uh, outlined it for, or, or explained it to me, not explained it. He he pointed out to me that these three movements of reading scripture together and then going and wandering and wondering and then coming back together in the circle for sharing are really the three-part sermon. It's not just delivered by one person. It's delivered through scripture, through contemplation and encounter, and through sharing. And everyone's voice is part of that. Um, and then, yeah, discipleship. Uh, another um, influence for me on this journey has been Chad Myers and his Watershed Discipleship um, uh, book. And the idea that as disciples of Christ, we can also be disciples of our watersheds um, in terms of uh, serving our watersheds as servants of Christ. And that um, the wounded Christ is also in the woundedness of our world. And so, um, yeah, how we, how we allow worship in and with creation to transform our hearts and minds in a way that then transforms our lives in how we relate to uh, the world around us, both locally and, and more broadly. Um, what else that I thought? And yeah, that, that intersects with being justice oriented, um, which I think is a, a high um, value for Anabaptists. So, you know, wanting to, to practice restorative justice with our neighbors, 
And when we ask who our neighbor is, you know, our neighbors are the least of these among us humans, uh, but also perhaps the endangered species. And um, yeah, the, the more than human world is a, is a phrase that I've come to use and come to love that be, that expands our idea of, of you know, when God's, when the, when the Bible speaks of all flesh, all my life I read that as humans, but really um, all flesh is all flesh. It's, it's beyond the, the human community. So it's an expansive, it's an expansiveness. And I think Anabaptism embraces um, welcome and inclusion and um, grace for all. So that's maybe how I'd answer that. Thank you. Um, one quick question is, do you um, begin your forest church always at the same place or do you kind of move locations around? So Burning Bush Forest Church has two, two parks in our city where we meet most of the time. And intentionally, in our, our first year of gathering, we actually met at a, a, quite a variety of parks in the city to get a feel for them and to explore what worked. Our second year, we decided intentionally to plant ourselves in one park and to experience the full four season cycle of what that park um, is like in each month of the year, each season of the year. Um, because, um, and, and yeah, to, to deepen our connection with that one particular place. Now we continue at that place uh, quite often, but during the pandemic, um, when people were allowed to go outside but not do much else, it became a very popular and busy place. And so we've sought out a few more uh, quieter parks and, and we go back there uh, sometimes, but we have about three places that we've gotten to know quite well. And there are other wild churches or forest churches that do have one single location where they meet uh, either on a property that someone owns or at a campground near where their town is or even on church grounds. Um, yeah, there's a whole variety. Uh, you mentioned that there's a forest church network. Is there a place that people can go on the internet and kind of get a little more information? Yeah, I will put um, the Wild Church Network website, actually. I'll, I'll put that in the chat. That would be good. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll say, um, like, when the, Wild, when the Wild Church Network started um, six or seven years ago, I mentioned there was about a handful of us, and now there's over 100. And um, almost 10% of them are related in some way to Mennonite uh, or Anabaptist churches. And I think partly it's from the fact that two of two of the five of us who started it were Mennonites and um, just through our networks and connections it's it seems to have resonance with and among Mennonites. I am kind of surprised at myself that I really haven't thought of Forest Church or Wild Church as an intergenerational you know expression but it is it's just so clearly is that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had people into their 90s attend and someone in a wheelchair. Um, you just have to be aware of accessibility issues. And it's, it's not, um, it doesn't have to be prohibitive for people with different abilities. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. We'll turn to Joel now. Joel at East Union Mennonite Church is planning to use some of the intergenerational shine materials from Menno Media this summer. So um, I'm gonna ask you a few questions at, all at the same time and you can answer them in whatever order you'd like to. So first of all, can you describe some of the shine materials and um, explain how you chose what you thought would work for your congregation? Maybe some examples of what you thought would work and what wouldn't and why. And then are there any accommodations in services that you are making to enhance intergenerational worship experiences? Yes, thank you. Um, we've, uh, over the last five to six years, we've done something that we've called um, Summer Second Hour. Uh, and this year we're calling it Summer Sundays. And essentially it's 
given us permission to sort of experiment during the summer months to try to incorporate uh, all age groups and adapt to our our vacation schedules and and, and people's attendance schedules. Uh, this summer we're using uh, Shine's current intergenerational materials. And uh, part of what drew us to this is that it's an entire um, worship service and second hour put together. And so we're, we're calling it Summer Sundays because we're looking at it as an extension from the beginning of church service all the way through uh, Sunday school hour. What we liked about it is that it offers us a whole bunch of different ways to do the worship service together, including um, uh, all sorts of uh, worship materials. So I like to say that we are homemade high church. Um, we like to, to have lots of different people participate in worship, um, but we still uh, appreciate sort of the traditional aspects of hymn singing and, and liturgy and, and, and those aspects. And so the curriculum offers all of that. So this summer, we've encouraged folks to engage with us and uh, offered up to you know seven to eight or nine different people coming and offering the call to worship, a prayer, or some other aspect in the in the worship service. Part of our accommodations then have been to um, to help uh, maybe some of our older folks to speak from the floor instead of going up to the podium, uh, offering. Um, handheld mics for younger kids, those kinds of things. And then when we transition to our, our second hour programming, we do so down in our basement and we gather around um, table groups. One of the things that I have appreciated about this uh, curriculum as well is that it offers questions that sort of start at the, uh, the most basic level. So what do you like best about the, the story in, in, in the scripture verse? Um, anybody can answer that question. And then it can go into a little bit deeper, like how have you personally experienced this and, 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 and how have you grown? And so we encourage our kids to sit with adults. It doesn't have to be a, a parent or a family member. We encourage uh, folks to engage with one another at, at different levels. And, um, and we offer a variety of activities. The other piece that I think is, is helpful whenever you're choosing a curriculum is, is to choose one that has lots of content so that you can scale back to what you would like to use. So this, this uh, you know, they have um, coloring pages, they have a reader's theater every, every week, they have uh, the general questions, they have stations that you can set up so that people can rotate from table to table. And they have uh, items that you can take home to work with. Um, I'm not a spokesperson for Menno Media and, and their intergenerational curriculum. I have found it to be helpful. We have found it to be helpful. And it's, it's helped us to do it during the summer because of the change in schedules. But then that's also carried over into our, our yearly worship as well. There's sort of a permission that we've granted ourselves through this experimentation to then try something new uh, during the, the regular quote unquote church year. And part of that has been in um, interviewing folks. So uh, Justin talked about sharing our stories. We've, we've tried to do that as well by interviewing different people from across the, the generation. Um, and what's fascinating is, is we are a church where people have been attending you know, together for 50, 60, 70 years. And yet when you interview someone and allow them to share their story with the congregation, you'll find something new out each and every time, a mission story, something that happened to them as a kid. And, and, uh, and it's, it's fascinating that, that those stories, how they connect us uh, to each other, and then also just allow us to, to enjoy a new aspect of one another. I don't know if that touches on some of what you're asking about as far as the curriculum piece. Art, would you like to share any, um, any particular items that you didn't use that you thought might work for another 
community, but not for yours or, or a particular one that yes, this will definitely work for us. And how did you make those decisions? Yeah, again, uh, we have a, a committee or group of people that, that have um, that help, help to plan each and every week. One of the things that we really appreciated was the Reader's Theater because you can hand it out to folks and use lots of different voices. Um, you know, it might exclude the youngest kids in the group, but uh, with a little help, you know, you can even encourage young readers to, to participate. It doesn't have to be planned out. It doesn't have to be practiced. You can just run with it and it, and it helps to share the story in a new way. Um, as well as uh, we've used the, the questions from it, as I said, I think it helps to, to have sort of a broader question and then go into the more specifics. But then as far as some of the activities, you know, some of them work, some of them don't, and we pick and choose and uh, let the ones that maybe take a lot of planning, we let those go and pick up the ones that are a little bit easier for us. We've tried to keep it as, as simple and easy to do as possible. And we've uh, tried to make it so that leaders can, can uh, pick it up and go with it. And we can switch out those leaders week to week. So it doesn't put the burden on any one person or any one group, which is especially important during the summer months, at least for us. Yeah, wonderful, thanks. Um, I'm going to turn, turn to questions from the chat now. And if anyone has additional um, observations or questions they want to add, you're welcome to do that. Um, but going back to Roberta, um, someone asked, how much are you finding that people who do not have children in their households are participating in Messy Church? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, it, To be honest, most of the people who participate in Messy Church are people with children in their households or grandparents bringing their children because they're, um, they want to be involved or nephews and aunts and uncles and so forth. But there are ways to bring the, uh, to uh, get people without children involved by um, having them become involved in the planning of it and also doing some table hosting, also uh, getting involved in the meal. Um, there are some other uh, forms of messy church. It sort of started as this one thing and then it's morphed into different things. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that it can really be contextual to your own location and to your own denomination. Uh, in the UK, there are several Call, things called messy vintage, where they've actually taken uh, messy church into nursing homes to sort of try to get uh, people involved that way. So um, most of the people who um, get excited about messy church are people with uh, children. I just came off of a, um, just came home from an international conference in the UK and there was, it was very exciting to see a bunch of young leaders of Messy Church who grew up in Messy Church and are now um, moving into leadership in Messy Church and having them be involved in the planning of the international conference and the leadership of the international conference, so. There was also a question that then Wendy answered in the chat, but I just want to say it out loud in case anyone didn't um, is, hasn't been following the chat. Someone asked if if um, Forest Church needs to be done out at parks and in in uh, in, uh, in actual forest. And you said there's a group that that meets in a Walmart parking lot. You yeah, I can say that? a little bit more. So yeah, the that's that's partly why the why the Wild Church Network isn't called Forest Church here in North America is because that sort of led people to think, yeah, it has to happen somewhere really, you know, forested or, or out there in, in sort of what nature uh, dedicated areas, but really it can happen anywhere. And we want to remind ourselves that nature is everywhere. It's not just uh, out in the park, um, but it's anywhere we're under the open sky. And yeah, I mentioned that there's a group that has met in Walmart parking lots and even there, there's the sky, the clouds, there's crows, um, there's, you know, insects, there's other things that, that we can still connect with. And, and I'll note too, that when we meet in parks in our city, we can always hear the, the sound of the expressway uh, and the traffic wherever we are. And that is a reminder to us of our 
our human um, impact on creation. And so, you know, wherever we're meeting, we're, we're holding those things in tension um, about the, the place of nature in our urban settings and our human impact on creation. Yeah, and maybe it's worth mentioning that human creation is part of God's creation. Yes. And there are positive and negative impacts. Mm -hmm. Meditate on all of those. I wonder if any of the panelists um, were struck by something someone else said that, oh yeah, that, that applies to my church or anything you wanted to comment on? I might just add that uh, in addition to our summer second hour programming, like I don't think of it as messy church. I don't think of it as, as wild church, but, um, but we do try to get outside. We have Camp East Union. We have, um, you know, putt-putting and going to the swimming pool. I think the more that we can, what I like about hearing about the messy church and about the wild church is that it, it's giving us permission to look at church as being more expansive, more broad than just in our physical buildings on a Sunday morning. And I think all three of you, um, just included, have, have talked about that, that, that in North America, sometimes we've, we've gotten really focused on Sunday morning worship in a pew, singing a song and gathered together and then that's it. And I think what you're hearing today is that it's, it's much broader than that. And we experience God in so many different ways. And so the more that we can offer those kinds of opportunities, not, not one generation is going to benefit from that. That is an intergenerational experience. I, I also wanted to say that um, Messy Church there's a lot of part of the reasons why I went with Messy Church as an intergenerational model is because there are a lot of resources for Messy Church and that anyone is welcome to use Messy Church resources. Uh, if you call yourself a Messy Church, then we need to know about that and we need to know about that type of thing. But anyone is uh, welcome to use. And there's a lot of books. There's also a lot of things up on our website that you can like you could have used the Messy Church Pentecost session that had activities and a celebration time and so forth and not called it messy church is what I'm trying to say there's there's resources out there and I I think I agree with you Joel just just moving the church outside of the building not only outside of Sunday but also outside of the building messy church usually does not happen on a Sunday morning usually it's a time other than Sunday morning so a lot of messy churches meet on Saturday morning Saturday afternoon Wednesday evening Sunday evening as a way to um, we we view it as a as a alternate worship experience for the for the traditional church I have an observation um, one of the one of the characteristics of um, the way we as Anabaptists think about children and that um, shine curriculum tries to um, approach things with is that children already have the capacity to have a relationship with God and they already have a relationship with God and what I'm hearing in both Messy Church and Forest Church is I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that we come to these things with an assumption that, you know, a 12-year-old is in relationship with God, has spiritual sight, you know, when they have their half hour of wandering and wondering, it will be fruitful, right? Um, and we think about, of that not just for a 12-year-old, but for a six-year-old or a four-year-old. And so that's just an observation I would make is that as we, and this is exciting to me too about intergenerational church in general is um, just that, that assumption that we bring that children are already spiritual beings. They're already in relationship with God. I have a question for Justin. Um, you're a youth pastor, correct? And I wondered if you could tell us about um, what you hear from youth about ways of worship that work for them or that they find restrictive or that allow them into worship better. Ways that they find are helpful for them or restrictive. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I love just the, the overall spirit of creativity and, and thinking outside the box today, because that's something that I definitely, um, youth are, are, are hungry for today that I talk to. Um, one of my favorite uh, painters, uh, Scott Erickson, who some of you may know, always talks about how if you love the form, you have everything to lose. But if you can see how um, the form can be played out in various spaces, you have everything to gain, right? And so um, when I talk to youth, so many of them were just, like, uh, life is so busy. There's so much pressure to, to get ahead in life in so many arenas that they're looking for spaces to slow down and pay attention. And, and it doesn't have to be on a Sunday. And sometimes I think if, if we're too attached to that Sunday, the three songs, the sermon, the song, and then you go home, that's where I, sometimes we lose them because they're looking for connection. And, and sometimes those aren't necessarily the spaces for connection. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're brilliant and awesome. Um, but if we're more attached to that, thinking that in and of itself is, is gonna be the answer to everything versus a, as we witnessed today, whether through a, a curriculum that thinks differently or whether through two different forms, um, uh, from, from what I hear from the youth that I, I get to work with, they're looking for spaces and spaces doesn't necessarily have to mean one thing. And, and the more I think open and, and, and creative we are and, and, and more we kind of meet them and, and ask them what they need and what they want, I, I think that's, that's what I'm hearing in general is, is they, they want to explore some alternatives, whether for it is uh, Messy Church or Forest Church or whatever it can look like. So that's, that's what I'm hearing from my end a little bit. I think I'm experiencing myself a little bit too. I'm not a, really a youth anymore, but I, I, I'm, I'm maybe a little bit past. And I think that that's something deep and, and near and dear to my heart too. Thanks. Um, we're hearing in the chat that someone wants to um, unmute and, and say something, and that would be fine. I'm not sure who that was, but you can just go ahead. I think that, I think that might be me is that I, I asked question of Annalee. Uh, right. So I'm, my name is Bev Suter Van Gladwell. I am a member at Waterloo North Mennonite Church and uh, ordained minister in the Mennonite world, but uh, have been in a nursing home as a chaplain for the last uh, two decade and a half. Um, I wanted just to uh, put in a word for the Logos ministry uh, as an intergenerational option for Mennonite ch churches. I was one of the people uh, along with Wendy Jansen's husband who helped to start the Logos ministry at our church. And it is built on, on uh, one of its pillars is that of worship, worship skills, teaching children how to worship. And the notion is that worship is as essential to the church as breathing is to the body. And so we really worked every week when it was a midweek ministry, we really worked at teaching the children um, uh, worship skills, whether it was helping or learning to usher or uh, uh, read, read script, scripture or uh, enact scripture or depending on the age of the children to um, uh, uh, music it was a huge part of, of what was done in worship skills, drum, drum circles, singing, uh ukuleles chimes we did many many kinds of music acting and uh it was a, a huge piece of bringing all ages into worship on sunday mornings and the other idea is that of course when children are a part of of the sunday worship are, are a part in playing a part in helping to lead worship then the, the children who are in uh the pews are listening in a whole new way because these are their peers who are up front so um, uh, Logos Ministry is not an easy thing to start. It's a lot of effort, but it is an amazing thing to, to run in your church. There's element, I, what I'm hearing from, from many of you, from you, uh, you know, from Messy Church and, and on uh, this, the Shine materials. There's lots of elements of those things, but this is a specific midweek ministry that... Um, comes uh, initially from the Presbyterian Church, but has made its way at least in uh, Southern Ontario into lots of Mennonite churches. So that's what I wanted to say. I love logos. Thanks, and um, Annalie put in the chat, if anybody else wants to speak about anything, you're welcome to. We know there are a lot of um, 
pastors and worship leaders and, and a lot of experiences and expertise in this room. Um, I, I'm also aware that it's 2.30, 2.31 by my uh, clock. So of course, if you if you need to leave, you are welcome to, to bow out. But if you'd like to stay and chat a little bit longer, a few of us can stay at least. Or if you have further questions, you can unmute or put those in the chat as well. I put in a resource in the chat, a couple of resources in the chat, one from John Roberto. He's created a whole set of intergenerational um, faith formation materials that are free on his website. And then Gen on Ministries. Um, I don't, somehow when Bev mentioned logo, Logos, I thought of Gen on Ministries. I'm not sure they may have been connected at one point, but in any case, Gen on Ministries, um, also, I think started out Presbyterian, but is kind of an independent thing now. And I've been in conversation with them at various points. They really, they have some nice resources as well. They are the same. Okay, thanks, Beth. Yeah, I think, uh, another place is uh, the Building Faith uh, um, out of Virginia Theological Seminary has a lot of intergenerational resources also. I think if you just would Google Building Faith, they do a lot of publication and so forth. I also mentioned in the chat, there's something called Intergenerate. There's an Intergenerate Australia. There's an Intergenerate US uh, that has a, um, has a conference, but there's also books that, that, have, that have been put out from that. So those are ways to look at a lot of different um, models of doing intergenerational ministry. There have been a lot of um, resources put into the chat. So maybe we can, um, we can, Ali and I will, will compile all those and post them along with the, the link to this recording. We will post it on our um, AWN Facebook page and also the Anabaptist, AWN is Anabaptist Worship Network website. So all of these um, resources that have been mentioned, we'll copy down all the, those links and try to uh, circulate those. Well, thank you all for joining today. This was a wonderful conversation. And um, as I said, watch out for the, the links. We'll post those. And um, you're always welcome to get in touch and ask questions. Um, any last words from Shanna or Annalie? Uh, just, I'm happy to um, talk further with anyone about uh, this, you know, if you want to, if, if you're a little bit overwhelmed at the moment and you want to talk through, okay, how will I actually do this in my own con congregation or in my own ministry, do feel free to get in touch with me. I'll put a quick, um, I'll quickly put my web page with my contact information there uh, and I'd be happy to talk with you and talk that through. All right. Thanks again to all of our panelists and everyone who came today. Have a great day and happy worship planning. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>